Sports at nine. Wild food, that's what hunting and gathering is all about. This is a journey into Britain's ancient way of life as we attempt to find the foods eaten by our hunter-gatherer ancestors. In the far northwest of Britain lies a remote, barren and windswept island, a bleak but stunningly beautiful place. This is the island of Colonsay off the west coast of Scotland. I've come here because an incredibly important archaeological discovery was made here, one that was the inspiration for this journey. More than 8,000 years ago, our ancestors gathered here to camp. And we know that as remains of their feasting have been found. Rare and exciting evidence of what woodland food our ancestors ate. Colonsay is now deforested. But of course, back then, in the Middle Stone Age or Mesolithic, like most of Britain, it would have been covered in trees. In this program, I'm going on a journey to explore the wild food of the woods. I'll be back in Colonsay later, but first I'm heading to the south of England, to a forest which is more like the landscape our ancestors would have known. If there's one place that I really feel that I can connect with the spirit of our ancestors, it's here in Broadleaf Woodland, particularly at this time of year the autumn, with so many fungi, nuts and berries to collect. It's incredibly exciting. But of course, back in the Mesolithic, it would have been a very busy time. Back then, the hunter-gatherer would have had to make the most of this time to gather for the coming winter, and would have been acutely aware of what was available. Of course, the forest itself was the very fabric of our ancestors' life. It was their supermarket, their drugstore, their hardware store, all things rolled into one. And it was vital that they had an understanding of all the materials that grew around them. And this is a sallow, one of the, the goat willows. And um, the bark on these withies here is excellent cordage. The shoots can be woven into baskets. And if you take the ends of the branches and chew the bark up at, at the end. You see, I don't know what you can see there, that's the last year's bark. You chew that, you get a very strong astringent taste, just like aspirin. And this contains salicylic acid and was one of the ancient medicines that were used. In fact, aspirin was derived from salicylic acid, which was originally found in willow barks. So everything around you, if you lived back in those days, was of importance. One of our most ancient and iconic trees is this, the oak. The mighty oak tree has played a very significant role in Britain's recorded history, but it may also have been important in our prehistory. In other parts of the world, where you find acorns, you find hunter-gatherers using them as a staple food. What we'd like to know is whether they were used in that way here as well. Joining me on this journey of discovery is my friend, Professor Gordon Hillman from University College London. He's a paleo-ethnobotanist and come rain or shine, spends his time studying the relationship between plants and people. The technique we're going to use to process the acorns is one which we've seen modern-day hunter-gatherers use around the world. Worldwide, we find that uh, wherever acorns are available, people use them, even if they have other sources of starch. And the reason for this is they are very nutritious. Uh, they contain not just uh, carbohydrates, but also fats and uh, a bit of protein too. In Britain, we have two species, and both of them are generally very bitter. And this bitterness is due to tannins. 
it's a bit like chewing a, a tea bag. It's, it's, it's pretty, pretty, pretty bitter. When people use these things worldwide, people were prepared to go to the trouble of getting rid of the tannins by often quite complicated methods uh, in order to get this nutritious resource uh, in, 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 their, in their diet. How's it going, Gordon? Oh, it's a bit damp. <laughs> oh, there's a severe weather warning in place today. <laughs> I think we're doing really well, but I was thinking about that and thinking about our ancestors doing this, and I've often wondered whether this seasonal resource mm. induced them to move their whole communities for a period of time to oak woodland, because it, it's a long process, it's it very is, involved, indeed. and then you could place yourself there and make a proper roof. That's right, we've got the acorns and everything on, on the spot. Yeah. And of course, it was the Chumash in, in California, they, 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 that's exactly what they did. They apparently moved the whole camp for two weeks to the acorn grounds, up into the hills. Gordon has split the nuts before drying them, as it makes it easier to remove their shells, which has to be done before crushing. Archaeological evidence of such processing is slim, but combining it with our knowledge of modern hunter-gatherers around the world, we can begin to get a picture of what might have been in Britain. Some groups in North America actually chose to use the most bitter ones because they had a higher fat content, even though sweet ones were available. So obviously these fats are obviously one of the important nutrients they're after. And I think fat from uh, plant foods is actually quite a rarity in nature. So that's something they get particularly targeted with acorns. The next process is to take this meal that we've ground up with the acorn meal and put it into a bag which we can put into a stream so that the water will wash out the tannins. This is the sort of bag that Aboriginal people use in Australia for a similar process to, to leach toxins from edible roots. But this is too open a weave for the acorn meal, so I can't use that. In fact, it's one of the pieces from the archaeological jigsaw that's totally missing, is these sorts of tools. They just don't survive from our Stone Age past. So instead of a bag like this, we're going to improvise with a little bit of modern technology and use a mosquito head net, which is a very fine weave, will hold the meal and still allow the toxins to pass through. So. Another method for leaching could have been by putting the meal onto a bed of sand and then pouring water over so that the sand would act like a sieve. So, we'll put this in the stream, get it good and wet first. You can see the tannin coming out there. See that colour? Now I'm going to tie that off. and leave that to leach. Gordon and I now have a chance to explore further and build a bigger picture of our ancestors' lives. Thousands of years ago, after the Ice Age, Britain was covered in dense forests of pine and birch. But these were slowly replaced by other trees, such as beech, elm, oak, and hazel. The forests that our Mesolithic ancestors knew would have been a little different to the ones we know today. One of the trees that they would have been very familiar with is this, the lime tree. We know from archaeological records that the wood of the trunk was sometimes hollowed out to make dugout canoes, but they would almost certainly have made good use of the bark, maybe making bark canoes, bark containers, perhaps even living and in houses made from bark of the lime tree. Certainly the inner bark was used for string. It's an incredibly useful tree. Today we only really see it in parks. Of course there are trees we think of as native but which wouldn't have been around in the Mesolithic. For example the horse chestnut tree which was introduced into Britain in Roman times as was the sweet chestnut. Love it. Continuing our journey through the woods, today Gordon and I 
are investigating some of the fruit still bountiful at this time of year, fruit which would have been around thousands of years ago. This is a prolific fruit of the countryside, the crab apple. This one looks like it may have some uh, ordinary apple genes within it. You get a lot of that today. And those are, are usually less tart than the true crab apple. When it's like this, you can uh, shake the tree and it'll rain apples down. So it's a very easy thing to collect. Let's see what that's, uh, that one's like. That one's not too bad. That's what I think. I think that's got some modern genes in it. A bit bitter. Astringent. A lot of tannin in there. But cooked over the fire, that one will probably be all right. But I don't think our ancestors had crab apples as favourable as this one. As well as eating them straight from the trees, the hunter-gatherer would have had to find ways of preserving fruit as a useful food source throughout the lean winter and we're going to attempt one possible method. Hawthorns are tricky to pick, but I've improvised a simple technique which may well have been used all those years ago. Pretty good, aren't they? Yeah, they're pretty good. Yeah, they're about, they, yeah. about done. Yeah, they look lovely. They're nice and ripe, aren't they? This yeah. Batch? Well, I've brought with me the bowls we're going to need oh, good. to do yeah, this. That's perfect because it it'd be good for people to see. Yeah, sticky stuff by the time you get going. What we're going to do is we're going to start to get the juice from these berries, and it's not an elaborate process. It's quite simple. I'm just going to crush them with my hands and squeeze the juice into this bowl. Obviously your ancestors didn't have this apparatus, but I'm using this because I want you to be able to see clearly what happens. They're very dry this year. Yes, that's a very, very dry fish, isn't it? This is much, uh, much drier, much this more gooseyness, isn't it, than uh, yep. normal? And more. We've had to add a little bit of water because this year the berries are very dry. Normally you don't have to do that. And um, what I need to do now is to start to skim out the stones and the particulate matter. I just do that with my hands actually. It's quite easy to do and just squeeze the juice like so you can see although it's very messy we are getting most of the juice, and most of the stones, with the odd one escaping, Gordon's hooking those out, but most of the juice is going into this bowl, and the pile there is mostly stones and flesh. That's right. I don't know whether you can see it, but it's already starting to thicken. And that's one of the things that's amazing about this, is that this is actually going to go hard. It only takes five minutes and it's set hard. And uh, what I'll do is I'll turn that out like a sandcastle. Like that. Now that fruit jelly can be sliced and laid out in the sun on mats to dry into a hard fruit leather. And then that can be stored long term. I've got some in here. And that's what it looks like when it's been sliced and dried. In fact, this is three years old and it's still absolutely delicious. It's sweet and very, very tasty. That's beautiful. It's the nearest thing 
to a sweet from a sweet shop. You want that? Yes, it's a fruit gum. It's still as good as it was three years ago. Yeah. We've got no evidence that this was done in the past, but I think that if our ancestors were aware of this, what we glimpse here is um, a food and, you, a, and a taste, a flavour, that we just don't attribute them with as having. No, that's right, especially once it's gone dry. That fruitiness has come, becomes much stronger, doesn't it? It's lovely. It's, it's, a, it's an apple licorice, really, that's isn't right. it? A wonderful food. Our Mesolithic ancestors lived in a time before metal or pottery. The mystery surrounding the way they would have prepared and cooked food without pots is something which really interests me. Around the world, we see modern hunter-gatherers using basket work in ways we wouldn't imagine possible. Today, I'm meeting with Linda Lemieux, who has been making baskets for over 20 years. She's demonstrating how to make a coiled basket, which, if tight enough, can hold water. Now, this style of basketry, the coiled basket. Coiled basketry, yeah. I'm sure that it'd be in common because we have good materials, don't we? For... Absolutely, we've got loads of soft materials, rushes and, and uh, straws and grasses. And I'm sure they would have made lots of bowls and like you're making finer, there. exactly like I'm making here, with the most primitive of tools and stitching it with anything that was to hand. OK, so here I'm just joining a new skein. And I use the bone to make a little channel through the rush so I can poke the skein through and stitch it and hold tight. Beautiful pace to life though, isn't it? Doing this sort of thing. Definitely. <laughs> I think you know I think in a sense more people should try it. <laughs> this is like time travel. To sit here and, and do a bit of this. Yeah. Oops. The irony is that you know these type of baskets don't survive in the archaeological record. It's so rare to find anything like this. Tantalising. Yeah. What about that one there? That, that's from Britain, isn't it? That's from the Orkneys. Yeah, yeah. And that's straw. That work. Um, and it's a modern-made one, and they've used ordinary um, string. Sizal string and straw. <laughs> yeah, and straw. But the way it's radiated yeah. but it, with it's a like twist, and it, it's gorgeous. It's like a star, isn't it? In the old days, they would have used junkus rush. Yep. So there is a clue that this type of basketry was here. Definitely. Well, one of the things that's really interesting about all of this technology, the knowledge is portable, in that if you've got the nimble hands, you've done this all your life since childhood, you can make these things swiftly, quickly. And it's a very lovely feeling too, that you can make a basket anywhere. And I frequently do, anywhere yeah. in the world. Wonderful. Yeah. yeah. The processed acorns have been left to leach in the stream for a couple of days to remove the bitter tannins. But to make it more palatable as well as digestible, we're going to attempt to cook it using one of Linda's baskets. We're going to heat rocks in the fire until they're red hot and then add them to the mush. That's good. It's it's fine, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine, it's gone, hasn't it? Yeah, no, it's actually lightened quite a lot. We know that this method was used in other parts of the world and it will be an interesting experiment. It doesn't look very appetising, does it? Um, well, it doesn't look too bad. You think if they served that up in a school dinner, <laughs> it would go down well? Well, as, as long as they put it with chocolate pudding, I think it might. <laughs> yeah, carob. It looks a bit like carob, doesn't it? Doesn't it? <laughs> I think I'd go more for a Did you say carob or cow bag? Slight smell of burning there. It's interesting that it smells like burning bread. Yeah. It does, doesn't it? It has that, mm. that uh, starchy taste. Yeah, yeah. It smells like toast.
I think that's about bongo. Mmm. Now that's got better suddenly. Oh, this is getting nice and hot. Mmm. It's very warming. This is tasting it's better. It's got a crunchy, nutty yeah. texture. That's really good. I like the crunchy bits. It's quite delicate. It's got a, mm. it's, it's like, it's like mm. a little bit wholemeal as well, isn't mm. it? Yes. And that's a staple food. It is, and it's very nutritious. Oh. And you can feel that when you eat it. It doesn't have the same um, feeling as eating potato, which that's gives right. you strong energy. Right. But this has that feeling that there's something longer, longer that's lasting. Right. That'll be the, that's the right. fats in there. That's the fats, you see. Well, there you have it. A very successful experiment. That is a delicious meal. It may be a rather unconventional means of cooking by today's standard, and it's not how we expect food to look. But it could well be that 6,000 years ago, this is exactly what British housewives, for want of a better word, were serving up to their families. Certainly, I'd be very happy to eat that, albeit with a little bit of venison on the side. Now, I couldn't take a journey through woodland at this time of year without including one of my favourite pastimes. This morning, we're on the hunt for mushrooms. At this time of year, one of the things that I constantly ponder is whether or not our hunter-gatherer ancestors used wild mushrooms for food, because in Britain, we don't have a strong tradition of using them, certainly not compared to Scandinavia or other parts of Europe. But we do have wonderful fungi that we can eat, and even names that suggest that. This, in English, we'd call this the penny bun fungus, Boletus edulis. It's one of the very best wild mushrooms for food. You can really see how it gets its name. It really looks like a bread bun. Mind you, it's a long while since they cost just a penny. Although mushrooms aren't an obvious source of energy, and certainly wouldn't have been a staple food, they may well have been used to help improve the flavour of less inviting food, and so encourage consumption. It's not taken long to gather a good haul for our lunch, but we've also come across one or two rare and rather poisonous fungi. Right then, Gordon, have a look at these ones. What on earth have you got there? The uh, question is, would you eat them? Well, no way. They, they, they look very suspicious to me. That's quite an unusual fungus. And I think this is uh, Satan's Boletus. If it's what I think it is, in the base of the stem, we should see like a little red tongue. And when I cut it through, we're going to see a colour change as it oxidises. And there it is. There's a little bit of red just there, you see? And the colour is going very, very Instantly. fast indeed. So it's just staggering. Well, glorious colour, but not a colour you'd wish to eat. No, and uh, that one is poisonous. Pretty, oh. Very dramatic. Lucky to see it, really. This is probably the wild mushroom that we're all most familiar with, mainly from nursery school books, where you have this drawn with a pixie beside it. It's, it's called fly agaric. And it's very interesting, and it's an important fungus to know about. It is poisonous, and it's a member of a family called the Amanitas. Now, the Amanita family is one of the most important families to know about because it contains some of the most toxic of all fungi. And they have certain features that it's very important to recognize. Firstly, they all have white gills, these blade-like things under the cap here, they're gills. And from these gills, spores drop. You can actually see the spores on my fingertips. And the spores that drop from the Amanita family are always white. The base of the stem is bulbous. And that's a very important identifying feature. When we collect fungi, we make sure that we get all of the mushrooms so that we can make a positive identification. If we broke the stem off halfway up and some of the other features were missing, because sometimes they fall off, we could misidentify this for something edible and be in a lot of trouble. Other identifying features of the Amanitas include a ring or skirt. And there are often spots on the top, although these can easily be washed off in the rain. 
There are other members of this family to watch out for too, including this one, the panther cap. But most deadly of all is the death cap. Just one bite of this innocuous looking fungus can cause a painful death by destroying the liver. There is no known cure and it's particularly cruel as you start to feel better just before you die. Gordon, who is a mushroom lover but not an expert, knows only too well what can happen if you eat a dodgy fungus. I once worked in the University of Cardiff and uh, we had a mycology department there teaching fungi. And uh, they sent me down the edible mushrooms every week after their laboratory classes because they, they, the people teaching the class didn't themselves eat the fungi. The lab technician brought me down my batch of edible mushrooms, supposedly. And she, she brought the wrong batch. So I ate them thinking they were perfectly safe and, and uh, edible. There's a genus called Sathirella, purple, purple jobs. I went to a nearby bar afterwards and had a glass of beer. And it immediately triggered a reaction. My vision went monochrome, not black and white, but blue and white. Then my memory started to go in waves. I'd forget how I started the sentence. Then I had difficulty breathing. Well, obviously it was a bit more alarming. And I thought, well, before I become unconscious, I better make uh, known uh, what, what I had eaten for the doctors. So I wrote the name of the fungus, Sathirella, down on a piece of paper and pinned it to my chest. The, the ambulance arrived and um, took me to hospital, and I was stomach pumped and I was okay. But it's, um, it's a measure of the degree to which a lot of these fungi that are less well known, like this uh, little uh, purple job, can indeed be quite dangerous, and so beware. But if you know what you're doing, fungi can make a delicious woodland snack. Wonderful thing about fungi is they are inspirational as a cooking ingredient and you can't really come out and collect some and not have a little impromptu picnic. And to make the best of them, I brought a few ingredients with me, certainly things our ancestors wouldn't have had. I've got a little bit of olive oil there. I'm gonna put some butter and some garlic in the pan. Get the oil very hot before I cook the fungi. And, um, and I'm gonna add some tomato, a little balsamic vinegar, some fresh basil, and serve it all on French bread. Sounds good, doesn't it? Oh yes, fungi, nicely sliced up. I'm cooking up some of the penny buns and also some summer boletus, well-known edible species. I'm now going to add some tomato to that and now a little splash of some balsamic vinegar. <laughs> and a little bit of fresh basil. You cannot beat fresh herbs. I've been looking around for some fresh wild herbs but there's been a lot of grazing in this piece of woodland and not much here. So a little bit of that in there, just warm that through. Smell of it. Where's that Gordon? Gordon, there's some lunch. Oh. You've got penny bun and uh -huh. you've got summer boletus. No, there's, 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 there's some garlic and some balsamic vinegar, fresh and basil fresh and tomatoes. Basil. Oh, lovely. Oh, that's fantastic, Ray. Mmm. Right. That's very tasty indeed. Nice. Mmm. Try some of that. That looks too good to be missed. Mmm. I have a mushroom with some plastic, aren't I? Very unusual flavour. Unusual flavour. What could be better? You pick them, and five minutes later you cook them. <laughs> um, superb. Lovely. Mm. It's fascinating to speculate what our ancestors would have eaten. But in some cases, we do have solid evidence of their Stone Age diet. 
My journey now takes me to the Scottish island of Colonsay, once covered in hazel woods, but now a barren and windswept island. And it is here that one of the most exciting archaeological discoveries of recent times has been made, one which sheds light on the hunter-gatherer diet. The work here is led by Professor Steve Mythen from the University of Reading. Steve, what have you uncovered here? Well, we're sitting at a Mesolithic camping site that dates to about eight, eight and a half thousand years ago. And the key feature is a large pit, about four and a half metres in diameter, that I think was the base of a hut originally, and that was later used as a waste dump, because it's, uh, it's packed full with decayed midden material. That's, that's, that's rubbish, rubbish plant material, bits of stone tools have thrown away. And what survives now is this thick black deposit. Uh, within that there's a fantastic quantity of plant remains. Uh, the, the, the key ones are pieces of charred hazelnut shell. These are what we dug up several years ago. And if you, if you look, these are tiny pieces of Good fragmented charred shells of hazelnuts. You can see it quite clearly, can't you? This and the, yeah, yeah, that's right. You can see they're definitely hazelnut shells. Yeah, definitely. And there were literally hundreds of thousands of fragments like that. Clearly the hazelnuts had been roasted for some time. My guess is that the charred ones are the ones that got burnt in the roasting pit, and they're probably chucking those charred ones away. And why do you think they were roasting the hazelnuts? Well, they may have been roasting them just to make them more palatable to eat. I mean, if you are eating quite a lot, they, they, they're rather better for you. It could be of roasting them as a means for storing them, because I think once they're, once they're roasted, they can store for several weeks, if not months. So they may well have been just particularly productive hazel woodland on this island, and putting a lot of energies into roasting large quantities and taking them off the island and using them over, this, over, the, over the next few months. It's very unusual, isn't it, to find this sort of remain from that period? Yeah, in quantity. A bit of charred hazelnuts are found on many sites, but normally tens or hundreds of fragments. But to find hundreds of thousands of fragments is really, really quite astonishing. Besides hazel shells, the team have come across other Mesolithic finds. They're using a technique called geophysics in which they're able to detect by computer where the magnetic property of the ground changes. So Karen, we got some uh, additional geophysics to the area to the south down there. For example, there's a quite nice um, dark anomaly, which is at... This suggests some disturbance there. and therefore pinpoints where to dig. And 21.7. Some time we'll check. One of the team, Sam, has come across some items today which really interest me. So this is what you found so far, Sam? Yeah, these have just come out of this layer just in here. We've got a sort of selection of sort of flint chips and things. Well, there are two things obviously shout at me straight off. Obviously there's that little tiny blade. I mean, that's beautiful, isn't it? That's a lovely piece. That's very sort of diagnostic of the Mesolithic as well. Yeah, you can see very clearly where that's been worked by people. These lovely scars from former blades on the core and then this one has been struck off. And a, a little bit of nibbly retouch on the Yeah, end. on the very tip. Yeah, yeah. I mean you could you could you could use that as it is, as a as a as a tip for an arrow or something like that. Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's very good. It's a lovely the, the other one that sh shouted at me was that. Because yeah. that's exactly what I make if I'm making an arrow. I take a, a shard and I just strike through to make this curve because that for for scraping an arrow shaft you got the perfect angle and it looks like it's some use, doesn't it? Yeah, no, definitely. I, th I think it's got these little nibbly scars, which might have been deliberately yeah. made, but my bet would be on them just being the result of using it. Yeah. I think that th this would have been worked, what, 7,000 years ago, something like that? Yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we're the first people to touch that. That is place. neat, isn't it? Yeah. It is exciting. You know, you like to think, well, maybe someone dropped that and spent a while looking for it and then gave up and yeah. 7,000 years later, there we are. What do you think about the people who are able to come here? Because, I mean, it's quite a crossing, even a modern ferry, isn't it? It, it is just amazing. I, I, they would have been using uh, either coracles or dugout canoes, and most likely moving fairly regularly, I think, between the islands, and having that knowledge of the, the currents and the crossing places and the coast, and had been totally at home in, these, in this seascape rather than landscape, because I think often they'd have been seeing the land from the sea rather than on the land as, as, as we do.
Considering just how many charred hazel shells were found on Colonse, it does seem quite likely that hazels were a staple food of ancient Britons at a time before farming and grain. Seeing first-hand evidence that builds a picture of the lifestyle of our hunter-gatherer ancestors has really inspired me. Back in the hazel woods of the south, Gordon and I now want to experiment with the technique of roasting hazels using a shallow pit which was used at that time. So I'm now going to line that with sand. And it's believed that sand was even brought in to some of the sites. So it played a, an important part in the process of the cooking. Of course, sand will get hot very quickly and holds the heat better than the soil. A few with weevils. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. Yep. So now we seal these with an airtight layer of sand on top. That's it. And now we build a fire on top of that. And we're going to small stick fire because we want lots of heat and the fire doesn't burn for very long. I always envision them going up to high places and looking out yeah. for the smoke from the campfires of their cousins. That's right. Right, well I'm going to start to open this now. The sand's very hot. And although it's only been a quick cooking, that's all we want. The nuts should have changed colour slightly. You can see the heat coming out. They look a little scorched. They're easily burned, very hot. Today, when we crack nuts, we have nut crackers, and we crack them on the side, and often break the nut. But we know from the archaeological record that the, the way our ancestors cracked them, which was like this, the flat end was put on a surface, and then the other end was struck with a stone. And that cracks it very easily and doesn't break the nut inside. <laughs> Perfect. Tastes like potato. Really nice cooked. They're much better than uncooked. Very good. And of course, much more, much more digestible, especially for children. Mm, oh yeah. They always say that children shouldn't eat too too great a quantity of the of the, of the fresh ones. I think this overcomes that problem entirely. It's incredible. That's a flavour from the past. It's beautiful. It's so improved. I find it incredible to think that this was probably one of the most widespread practices in terms of food at this time of year, 6,000 years ago or beyond, who knows how long ago. And that because we've managed to find just one or two fireplaces where this happened, we can piece this back together and breathe life into this ancient meal. But the forest wasn't just a source for staple food. It offered a huge variety of diverse resources, which provided vitamins and antioxidants, as well as carbohydrate and protein. Whenever you're walking through a forest, you have to keep your eyes very sharply focused on the leaves of the trees about you because that way you can come across a few surprises and this is a, a case in point. This isn't a common tree in Britain by any means but it is to be found in our woods. This is the wild service tree and I've always thought of this as the woodsman's tree because most people walk right past it and never even recognize it and there you see the leaf it looks like a flame and by the end of the autumn these are usually red, reminding us of the importance of the campfire in the coming season. Lovely leaf. And it has this edible fruit on it. These are service berries. 
you can call them checkers as well, that's another name for them. In the past people used to sell them and yet it's one of the wild fruits that's been forgotten today. The um, Prime Minister's house, checkers, is named after these fruits. These ones are a little bit yellow yet and they are not quite ripe. What you have to look for is this dark reddy brown colour like that one when they turn really soft and squidgy. Oh, that's really nice, beautiful eating, really nice and uh, quite delicious but it's very important to spit out the seeds because they contain cyanide. Our ancestors would certainly have made use of these berries and maybe like in other parts of uh, the world the berries could have been ground up and heated to drive out the cyanide from the seeds. We'll never know. There's very little cyanide in the seeds of wild service berry and you'd have to eat a lot of them to be poisoned. However, the woods are full of plants which contain varying degrees of toxins which we need to be aware of. In fact, most woodland plants that you see in the spring and summer, including bluebells, wood anemones and foxgloves, are all poisonous. This is quite an unusual plant. It's quite rare. It's called her Paris, Paris quadrifolia, beautiful plant. And that berry there, well, that's very poisonous. In fact, the whole plant is poisonous. How our ancestors figured out what they could eat, what they couldn't, we'll never know. We can only guess that they must have experimented with things. This is deadly nightshade, also known as belladonna, which means beautiful woman. It comes from a time when women would touch the berries and then their eyes, so dilating them to make them more attractive. Highly dangerous though, as the berries contain atropine, making them lethal. What interests us is whether our hunter-gatherer ancestors might have made more use of poisonous plants, perhaps even processing them to make some of them edible. Well, here we have a plant, quite a common plant, called the black bryony. It has poisonous berries, uh, poisonous leaves, and also a poisonous root. Now, the thing is, that root is quite big and it contains, a, 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 we suspect, a lot of starch. In fact, sometimes it's absolutely huge. So we're keen to find out whether or not this root might have been eaten by our ancestors. But first, it needs digging up. A few months ago, Gordon and I travelled to Australia to spend time with Aboriginal people who still use many of their traditional hunter-gatherer skills. This is the cheeky yam, which is related to black bryony and is also poisonous. We observed how they made it edible. The first step was to cook it over a fire sealed by bark and soil. So what we're going to do is follow their procedure in putting it on the fire, first of all, in the hot embers of the fire we've got here. Then we're going to cover it with hazel leaves to keep it clean, and um, then cover it with earth and leave it for an hour to, to bake. The next step our Australian friends used was to grate the cooked yams, ingeniously using an adapted snail shell as a grater. The grated yam was then put in a bag and immersed in a river overnight to wash out the poison. Gordon now grates the cooked black briny root and will leave it to leach in the same way. We'll leave it in the stream for about a day. Even then, though, we won't actually try tasting it because it's uh, too dangerous, too dodgy, especially if the method hasn't worked. So we're going to get it analysed uh, in, in a laboratory in London and see if indeed the, this, this method has been successful in getting rid of these toxins. This has got to be one of the most exciting environments in the south of England, a freshwater chalk stream. It's 
beautiful, it's so clear. You can see the fish in here really easily. Of course, from our ancestors' point of view, it meant food. Trout, eels, and back in those days, this would have been the sort of place you'd have come looking for spawning salmon as well. But there's another type of food in here as well, crayfish. And I've actually got a trap in here to see if I can get some. Let's see what we've got. And there we go. We've had some luck in there, some big ones in there. Now, the crayfish I've got in here, these are not our native crayfish. These are an invader that have found their way into our rivers and sadly carry a fungal disease which infects our native population and destroys them. So it's good to take these out of the water and they're going to be very nice eating. I'm going to cook the crayfish on skewers beside the fire and to make those I'm using this wood here, this is dogwood. It has black berries on it but they're not edible and uh, you see this time of year now the autumn's here it's turning purple colour. If you break the leaves in half, you break them gently, you'll find that from the veins in the leaf there's little threads that hold the two together that shows you that it's a true dogwood. It's a useful tip for identifying trees in other parts of the world. And um, some people say that it gets its name from the old English dagwood, which means skewer wood. And it's certainly brilliant for that purpose. You can see here what I've made already. It's, it, you can carve it very thin and it's very stiff. It's ideal for the job. I dispatch the crayfish quickly by cutting their spinal cord. And then there's a nifty trick for removing the innards. You take that central fin and you pull it until it goes click, pull it back the other way until it goes click. Now when you pull straight back, out comes the alimentary canal. And that's where I'm going to now push my skewer straight in like that. And that goes over in the heat of the fire. Once they're done, they'll be red all over and the tail flesh should be cloudy, not translucent in any way. You get a little bit of smoke comes out the hole where I killed them. And they're very hot, so you need to let them cool down. These uh, shells hold the heat. If you try to break that open straight away, you're guaranteed to burn your fingers. Oh yeah, that's just about handled about now. Break the tail away from the body like that. Beautiful. There's the crayfish tail. Oh, that is fabulous. Really nice. The good thing about these American crayfish, there is also some meat in the claw. Wonderful bit of wild food, delicious eating. That's delicious. Gordon has come to King's College where under the supervision of Dr. Tony Leeds, they have the results of the black briony testing. We'd like to know more about the poison present in this plant and whether or not processing it has removed it. One of the materials which is present in black bryony is oxalate, which is a salt which is 
present in many plants, in particular parts of the tissues like the stems and leaves of rhubarb and also spinach. Um, but the amounts that are present vary enormously and somebody using black bryony as a relatively sole source of starch uh, and protein might have consumed rather a lot. We've seen in looking at the microscope images that it's present as a very fine needle-like crystal. But what the microscopy has shown very clearly is that these crystals are present in quite large quantities. If this was a source of food, then the presence of these needle-like crystals might have created problems in some people with formation of stones. And I have um, acquired or borrowed some uh, examples of kidney stones from the museum here at King's College London. These are oxalate stones which were removed from the bladders of individuals. In some cases, a very long time ago, this one is, was removed in 1850. Can you imagine having that removed in 1850? Goodness me, but it's excruciating. Yeah. Now the big question is, has roasting and leaching removed the oxalate? Let's first examine the cheeky yam from Australia. Here is the raw cheeky yam, where you can see the arrows of oxalate, and here is the cheeky yam after processing, so it looks like it has been successful. So what about the black briny? Tony, what was the effect of these processing procedures on the black briny arrow-like crystals? Um, roasting and uh, leaching resulted in a reduction of the amount of oxalate. The analysis shows that the oxalate was removed as a consequence of the washing process. Do you think there's any chance that our ancestors could possibly have eaten this thing as food? I think that uh, they may have eaten it. I mean, as you know, when you actually um, roast it, um, and this is a freshly baked one, it actually has a, a, a smell which is very tempting. I have to say I didn't succumb to temptation. Yes, it does smell pretty good. It smells uh, very chestnutty. 6,000 years ago, maybe it was a relatively sole source of starch uh, and protein at this time of the year in the autumn and the, well, the winter and the spring, perhaps. It potentially, it could have been a useful food. However, there may be something else present as well. Uh, remember that the uh, the old herbal references to black bryony indicate that it's really a toxic, uh, the root is toxic. Yes, absolutely. So what we have proved is that the process we saw the Aboriginals using on the cheeky yam has also worked on the black bryony and has removed the harmful oxalate poison. We can't yet be 100% certain that it is now safe to eat because there may be other toxins contained in the root. But it does go to show that simple processes such as this could well have been used by our ancestors to make use of roots that we just dismissed today. We're almost at the end of our woodland journey, but there's one last thing I want to do, and it should be a real treat. What I'm building is a spit so that I can spit roast a wild boar. Even today in the summer all throughout Britain you can find pig roasts, hog roasts. I think it's one of those timeless recipes that has endured for thousands of years and uh, it's going to be really entertaining spit roasting a, a boar today, a real feast. The wild boar was a common woodland animal and would have been a celebrated kill by the hunter-gatherer. This is just a young boar but a large adult boar could weigh more than a red deer and would have provided a huge amount of meat. One of my favourite things about roasting a boar is the crackling, which I'm going to prepare by adding salt and then basting with honey. And to do that, I need a basting brush, which this piece of hazel should be ideal for. I've made a parallel log fire which throws out an amazing amount of heat considering how much wood is actually burning. A 
And what I'm going to do now, just because I can, is I'm going to baste this meat with honey for the last half hour of cooking or so. Oh, yes, indeed. Ba -ba -dum -ba -dum. Oh, yeah, the problem, Gordon, is I used to get carried away munching into a deal bit of this while I'm doing the butchery. Yes, I think it's uh, impossible not to. Oh. Beautifully cooked. Wow. Well, obviously, there's more meat here than Gordon and I could handle on our own. So I've invited some friends who've also helped us over the years in some of the projects to come and sample some of the delights of this boar. And um, apart from the sound of some of the crackling on the fire there in the background. The other thing I can hear is salivating off camera. Why don't you come and have some? If I give you something. Thank you very much. Mm, yes. <laughs> Although time has moved on thousands of years and we live in a very different world, we still have many of the wild foods our ancestors did, though sadly we have lost much of their essential knowledge. In this series, we've only scratched the surface of the resources our ancestors would have made use of, but it's been a fascinating journey. It has also made me feel closer to understanding where we've come from, not just in an historical sense, but in a way which tells us more about ourselves, and perhaps ultimately, where we are going. You know, when I go to museums and I look at exhibits of our Stone Age past, you've always got these illustrations of the earnest hunter returning with the animal with a stern look on his face. And you forget the sense of community that came from those activities. That's how I like to think of the past. Perhaps on this very spot 6,000 years ago, who knows, maybe a 13-year-old boy had shot his first wild boar with his uncle and everybody was collected together to celebrate. That's what I like to think about, the sound of laughter, of happiness, of people thriving in our landscape. What do you think? Not bad, isn't it? Stay with us on BBC Two for brand new unmissable drama. The corridors of power are about to sizzle with party animals next. And over on BBC Four, the evolution of Christian art in the art of eternity.